Okay, I would like to thank uh, uh, IIT Roorkee and all the organizers uh, and deans and the director for uh, allowing me to come here and speak uh, about something that I have been working for quite some time uh, in the form of an institute lecture. So um, what I have decided to do is uh, try to give you an idea of what is this word optimization means in our day-to-day -day work whether it you are belongs to whether you belong to mechanical engineering or any engineering or science or even social sciences or even your regular work what does it mean how does how does this affect uh, the work in in science and technology so scope and then starting with i'm going to talk about few methods uh, not to give you the details of every method but just to just to have you some idea of what we are talking about here some challenges and how we've been addressing them and some future trends but uh, so my email address is, is over here and this is my personal website and this is my laboratory which we call computational optimization and innovation laboratory in short coin so this is the beacon logo which uh, these just mentioned that I'm a part of it's an NSF center it's actually a center for study of evolution in action so we have uh, evolutionary people like who does uh, biological evolution and then compute, computational evolution all together about five six hundred people working together uh, in an interdisciplinary manner uh, then this is the Spartan logo for Michigan State University so before I proceed uh, it's a very happy moment for all of us and I was here just to witness what ISRO has achieved uh, just two days ago so I want to congratulate and I'm sure there are some IIT Roorkee faculty staff and students who have contributed somehow to this so let me I want to thank all of them and to the country for a wonderful job. So outline of my talk is going to be um, what is the scope of optimization in practice. Then um, I would like to uh, show it to you that optimization lies at the core of most of the problems that we solve today. And then I'll talk to you about some methods and I'm going to stress a little bit on this word customization or customized optimization because that's where I think the research comes in play. Uh, had this been like a finite element method among many other uh, automated methods that we often use these days and we can buy a software of finite element and you can almost easily try to use it to, to various problems. Uh, optimization is a different beast. It doesn't work that way. You cannot really download a software or buy a software and apply it to every problem that you face. So there is a bit of customization that is needed and that's where the researchers are going to always stay okay in between uh, applying it to an industry and coming up with a methodology so I'm going to highlight to it one or two examples uh, there's something that this mentioned about innovation innovation through optimization that's the crossover between these two words uh, in in other words it's actually some kind of knowledge discovery uh, what I experienced going to US and working with industries is the people there are interested in solving their problems I'm talking about the industries they're interested always in solving their problems but they're also interested in one other thing, which is, have I learned anything? So I've been doing this for many years. Uh, if again I have to solve this, do I start from scratch? Or do I already have some knowledge? So this is something is getting to be very important these days. They're not just the solution of the problem, but what is that we captured? What is that we've learned? Because that's going to take us further. And I think uh, you know, the, the new advances that we have in, in science and technology, particularly machine learning, data mining, artificial intelligence have come a big way in trying to get that knowledge captured in many, many different ways. Uh, then of course, uh, uh, one or two slides on current uh, research trends. So optimization has a long history, okay, but the word may not have been used that way. And this is probably one of the words that most often misused. I have seen so many industry people say, we have optimized our design. And then if I'm sitting there, as soon as somebody says I've optimized, you know, my strings go up and I say, what method did you use? Then they're a little jittery. They said, no, 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 we did just two or three solutions we evaluated and chosen the best one. That's really not optimization, but that, that word is misused very, very often. So you have to go 300 BC in order to see where the, the, op, the source of optimization. Euclid talked about if you have a line if, and a point in 2D or 3D, if you want to find the point that is closest uh, to that point on the line, it's basically the closest means you have to minimize the distance, right? So he talked about that that long ago with geometry. 
Uh, then Euclid also talked about if I, if I give you a, a piece of wire and you want to enclose it with a rectangle, uh, which one have, will have the maximum area inside? So these are simple problems, but these people back then were trying to figure out what the solution is. Is there a formal methodology by which you can get those things? Uh, Heron came and says, if I have a point here and another media point B, which way will the light travel? So the light always travel with the shortest path. So you can figure out what is the shortest path. Then if you measure the angles, you will see it kind of follows the Fermat's principle. Uh, Kepler did something very interesting. Uh, wine is, uh, you know, he was trying to figure out what should be the size and shape of a, of a wine barrel so that it stays for a long time. Uh, he did also another thing which is largely known as a secretary problem. Uh, these days, of course, uh, these have not much meaning, but he was suggesting an algorithm for choosing a wife, okay? Back in 1611, he said, okay, you have to interview few women, but the first one over E or 36.8 percent of the women, you interview, but don't accept them, okay? Then after that, you get serious, and the first one you like, you marry. So that's, that's the recipe. A lot of people still use this idea. And if they don't want to use an algorithm for solving a problem, not for choosing unfortunate, or fortunately not for choosing their wives. But he had a lot of theories, very simple theories for this optimal result. Uh, Galilee uh, talked about hanging chain, what will be the shape, and all these different things I mentioned here. Uh, calculus of variance, transportation, a lot of field medals and from mathematics went to, to people who did optimization related research. Then came to 19th century, all these big names, as you see, steepest descent method, application to forest, linear programming idea was first proposed by Fourier a long time ago. Uh, then uh, fast forward to 20th century, a lot of serious stuff happened in this field. Karush Kuntakar came in and gave a theory which we still use. Uh, then uh, Hancock, first book on optimization. Uh, this is available in a very small book here in bookstores, if you find that book. Uh, it just cost maybe 50, 60 rupees or something. It's a very nice small book to read about what was the first book on optimization. Traveling salesperson problem. Uh, uh, Kantrovich has got the Nobel Prize, okay, working in optimization. But really the application of optimization started after the S Second World War, okay, where they had to uh, really properly do resource allocation. So the birth of operations research started and a lot of things have happened with that. Even now we have good software, softwares for doing this. Uh, von Neumann's dynamic programming, Danzig's simplex method was for solving linear programming. So a lot of serious stuff start to happen. Applications have happened. Karmarkar was an Indian who suggested uh, uh, solving linear programming problems with large, very large number of variables, like more than millions. Uh, he found an interior point method for doing that. But starting around 80s, some new kinds of methods started to surface and these are called heuristic based methods. Most of these were math based but people realized that we could have alternative methods for solving complex problems. So my lecture today will be more towards this methods but we always recognize what on, on what foundation the optimization has been based on. So with that introduction let's now go and look at the scope of optimization in practice. This is a very busy slide but you can see that it covers uh, many areas probably, uh, you know, each one of you is interested in. Design and manufacturing. So you see lots of parameters here, some angles, some thicknesses, some materials. Uh, so those are your variables. If you're trying to design the cab, you have to figure out what should be the dimensions or numbers to each of these parameters so that let's say the overall weight is minimum. So that if I have a crash from the front, the passenger doesn't get too much force into him. Into him. So different kinds of criteria you can come up with and, and, and find out what should be the parameters so that those criteria are met. Then if you are a VLSI person working in electrical or electronics engineering, you are interested in placement of little, little components, you know their connectivity, how you are going to do this so that your overall area is minimum. And then supply chain, uh, then intelligence systems, prediction, you have already, let's say market prediction or weather prediction. So you already know how it has been. The market has been for last uh, few weeks, few months. If you can make a good model of it, then you can project it in the future for another month, maybe another few, uh, few months or a year. Uh, control systems, uh, people do a lot of optimal control and you probably have taken some courses in that. 
Uh, supply chain modeling is another area where optimization is used. Usually, uh, in these kinds of problems, um, you, you have an error minimization. So, a lot of data are available, and then you have inputs and you have one output. So, data is available for plant, and then you figure out what should be the, the modeling that we have over here so that the output from this, this one here matches well with the plant output. So a lot of modeling is based on the error minimization, uh, which is part of the optimization. So if you look at all these different problems, you think that, oh, it's a wide variety of problems. And, and when, I, when I went to, uh, to Michigan State and even in IIT Kanpur and I was there, this is one of the questions. I teach this and the students who have the opportunity to take the class, they see that there's so much application, but the students ask me, sir, why is this not course compulsory? to our curriculum because, okay, we have taken it, we got benefited, but why is it not compulsory? Because everyone graduating from a university like this uh, have some optimization backgrounds with which they can solve different problems. Industries will be crazy in, in hiring you because you have this problem solving ability. Uh, so that's happening with, with my lab. Most of my students are getting uh, jobs before they even graduate. That's because they, they have some kind of technology, some expertise that with that they can solve lots of problems for industries. So it's a, it's a good question and, I, and I'm actually working with MSU towards making such a course compulsory. Uh, there are new ideas that are coming in which are very interesting to me. One is, this one is called hierarchical optimization. A very simplest version of this is called bi-level optimization where there are two, at least there are two levels. So for managerial purposes, what we do is we divide our problems into different manageable units. Uh, here we are talking about government who makes policies, tax policies and for example, certain fertilizers has uh, very rich nitrogen, phosphorus and if you use too much of them in the field with water, they wash away to the lakes, to the uh, you know, ground water level and then those are not good. So the way the government can control them is to put high taxes on them. So government considers environment and their own revenue and comes up with some ideas of what the tax policy should be. Now comes the second level optimization where the farmers, the actual users, they look at these policies or tax prices and then they decide what they're going to do in their crop, what kind of crop they're going to do, how much fertilizer of this type or that type to be used. So they have their own objectives as well, like they want to maximize their profit, they want to maximize their production. Right? So these two problems are not independent, they are linked. But believe me, most of the time, these problems are solved totally independent. The government doesn't even consider if I put so much price whether the farmers are going to buy or not. Okay? So in many industries, they have such problems. And we are, we are fortunate to solve a problem from a chemical company there close to where we are, where there are three levels. It's called tri-level problems and we could see up to about 10% uh, reduction in the transportation cost if you can go into that level. So these are very challenging, difficult problems because there is one optimization inside the other, but there are methodologies that we are developing uh, to address some of these methods. So I think my conclusion with these things is that organizations need optimization experts for, for, for telling them what is the best way to do things, to design, uh, that is, uh, to, to, to make a design that nobody else can have close to it, you know, so all that kind of stuff. So um, continuing now with some methods of what kind of methods are there for getting to optimal solutions. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of methods, but you could divide them into these two classes based on the cardinality of the points that you're using in every iteration. So it's an, it's an iterative process. So this, this side we have point based methods where let's say my objective function looks like this, which means uh, there is a global maxima, there are a couple of local maxima, there is a minima, uh, this could be a global minima and this could be a local minima over there. This is just a hypothetical sketch, okay? But the industry problems that we solve are much more complex than this. There are many, many more optima, uh, they, the, the, the surfaces are not so smooth and all that. So it's much more complex, but let's take, stick with this example. So in point based methods, you start with a point, usually a guess point, usually a current design, for example, and you intend to improve. So these algorithms, which are usually math based, because you try to adhere to some kind of theory, uh, they will tell you, okay, now that you are here, move to this point. So that's one iteration. Then move to that point and so on and so forth. 
When you do that, usually these decisions are made based on local neighborhood information. You are not seeing from here that peak over there. You're not seeing. These algorithms can only look at what is around it. Look at means can evaluate only the solutions around it. So you don't get the global picture. So once you, once you go there, you're stuck because any other point you look when you're at the peak here, any other point you look in the neighborhood are worse than you, right? So you think, oh, I've conversed. And that's the end of the algorithm. In order to say that this is not the global one, then you have to start with another guess point, And hopefully, that will take you to a better one. But if this is very narrow and in, a, in one corner, it will take a lot of iterations before you can get there. On the other hand, there are population-based methods, where you start with a set of points. And these points move to another set of points. Sometimes they overlap. And it, so they have a much more global perspective, because you're not dealing with one point. You are dealing with number of points. And some of these methods are not math-based. Some of these methods are more evidence-based, more looking at is nature or in a physical system there is a simile to optimization, and can we go and find or kind of understand how the nature is solving it so we can create an algorithm. For example, if you look at bees and their, uh, their nest, uh, their hives, uh, they are hexagonal. And, and I give this as a, as, a, as a homework problem in my optimization class, show that a hexagonal shape has the minimum weight to the maximum strength. So weight by strength, if you do, that has the minimum. So not a square, not a triangle, not a pentagon, but just the hexagon. So the question is, nature has solved this. No mathematicians have solved this. Bees don't know calculus. But how are they able to come up with such, a, such an optimal design, which in class we mathematically proved to be optimal? So that's the interesting factor. And then you try to look at the whole methodology of trial and error, and, and there's a direction in which they may have failed with irregular shape, shapes first. And they realize that as soon as your shape becomes regular, it's more stable. With the wind, it still stays. But then they're still experimenting and figured ultimately that hexagon is the shape. Well, this may have taken millions of years for them to do it. But if you understand the process, then you can speed it up in a computer. Right? So the whole thing is to understand the process of getting there. And that's what these uh, uh, evolutionary optimization researchers are trying to do. So if you look at these methods, uh, we can come up with a very simple algorithm. Start with a point. Uh, you, all you need to do is come up with a transition rule that will change the x to y. Compare y with x. And if y is better, accept it. If y is not good, then create again. Then go back and create another point. And you do this till a termination criteria is considered. Usually, the termination criteria is when you are done with your time, or, or that's the time was allowed, or that many evaluations you could do, or you got a, a particular target solution met. Okay? So these kinds of methods uh, do not need too much memory, because you are storing only x and y. They have local perspective, as I said. Uh, even if you have parallel computing facilities, you can't use too much of them. Uh, easier to do theory because you're just tracking one point. Uh, not easy to be modified because whoever has developed it has told you exactly what the transition rule is. And usually these are based on gradients and all that. Even if you have some problem information, there is hardly you can use them. Okay? On the other hand, the population-based approaches starts with a set of points, which I'm calling here as a population. You still need a transition rule, which will convert the population to a new population. And some members can be common between the two. And then you combine the two population and decide, uh, the, you know, take the top of those, the best one of those, and you have another population. Continue to do till a termination criteria is met. This requires memory, okay? Because you need to store now P and Q. Uh, there is a global search, and then you have parallel processing you could do because you need to evaluate all these members before you go further. So if you have lots of processors, you could do that. Not easy to do theory. Uh, but they're very easy to be modified. So there are pluses and minuses in these two methods. It's good to know them. In most of our applications, we try to combine the two methods. But this theorem, you have to know before you can proceed further with this uh, idea of optimization. There are all kinds of algorithms. But in 1997, these two gentlemen had come up with this theory called no free lunch theorem. Okay? What it says is, if you have two algorithms, A1 and A2, and if you're interested in solving all possible problems, I'm putting it in a big F here, and A1 applied to every member of F will have some performance measure of how well A1 did on these problems. You aggregate all these performances on all these problems. 
let's say call that P1, do the same thing for A2 with every member, only make sure that you are using the same computer when you are doing same amount of resource, when you are solving with A1 and with A2, and you have an aggregate P2, their theory says P1 is equal to P2. So what does this mean? This means you spend three years of your PhD and developed an algorithm called A1, and there is some algorithm that exists somewhere called A2, your algorithm is no good or no bad than that algorithm. So the question is why do you spend three years doing the thesis, right? So that's the big question. So if you are interested in solving all problems, then that's the case. But if you are interested in solving a class of problems, let's say I'm only interested in solving that cap design that I showed you, or a gearbox, or VLSI, then NFL breaks down. Then you can have one algorithm that is best. So since this theory came out in 97, it's actually a theory, there's a proof for it, right? So 97, uh, people always say what kind of problems they're trying to solve and try to come up with the best algorithm possible. This also says what I started saying, that you cannot have one algorithm, could be a software, uh, that is best for all problems. But if you narrow down to a class of problems, do customization, you can come up with the best algorithm. So since then, people have been following this path. So let me skip these slides now. So what is customization? How, how can I achieve customization? Okay. So let me just show you one or two examples after I talk about this point-based method. So I'm just going to send this, to tell you about this one slide only on some of the point-based methods. So one point-based method is you start from a point and here is your optima, these are contours. So this algorithm, what I used here is called steepest descent. It says go along that direction it's going to reduce your function value because you're going in the negative of the gradient. Okay, so you go and find the best point along that line and that's your point. Then you do another iteration there, that means you do again uh, negative of the gradient and you go and you get close to the optima. So this is a point-based method. Somebody already said that which, which way to go. Now if you have some information that uh, x1 should be always twice x2, so x1 is one design parameter, x2 is another design parameter. You know that x1 should be more than x2. How can you use it over here? You, there's no way you can change the algorithm. So these are some of the difficulties you have for customization. There are other such methods as well with the point based or maybe they are taking few points to use it. But population based algorithms are very generic. You could do a lot of things over there but there is a onus comes with that that I'm going to talk to you about. So here is the structure of a population based algorithm. Um, you start with a population, <coughs> you evaluate, let's say these are my points, I'm evaluating, that means I know what is the function value, the criteria value, the constraint value and all that. Before I terminate, I'm going to use those good points, I'm going to actually first select some good solutions. So out of these maybe the good ones I'm selecting, let's say these four are, are good out of these seven points. And this is called a mating pool. This mating pool is now used and it is used to create new population. So the, maybe these open circle ones. And this is called the offspring population. In that process, we mimic the natural operators like recombination and mutation. The goal of the recombination is to take two parents and take some things from one parent and some other stuff from other parents and create a child. So we call these as children and these are parents. And sometimes we use this mutation operator with small probability where we take the, mute, the, the recombined child and part of the solution somewhat. So it could be done in a many different ways. If your variables are Boolean or binary strings, you simply change one of the ones to a zero, zero to a one, you'll have a new solution. It will have a new kind of uh, value for objective function and all that. So the whole idea of the variation operator is to apply operators on good solutions, which are the mating pool over here, P dash T, and then you create an offspring population. Once you've created that, then you um, evaluate them, then combine the parent and the offspring, parent is PT, offspring is P double dash T, and you keep the top half, and this is how you go till you terminate. So it's a very simple algorithm that you can use. All the red places here, you have the ability to modify, to change, depending on the problem information. So this is what we do. We keep the structure the same when we solve different problems, we try to look at what problem heuristics we can get and use it here to change it to customize. Uh, for these algorithms, asymptotic convergence proof exists. So sometimes people think these are kind of some game we are playing, but no, there are proofs exist. The proof says that with time, you are going to get closer and closer to the optima. 
but it doesn't say when you will get epsilon from the optima. It could be 100 years from now, but the proof says it's going to eventually go. So, many people are still happy with such a proof because if you take a random search method, there is no such proof. You can keep on doing for hundreds of years, you will not even get close to the optima. There is no guarantee. But Rudolph in 95 have proven that for us. Okay, so are these staying only in academics, just in classroom teaching, maybe two, three variable problems? The answer is no. Uh, there are lots of applications. I'm just showing you three examples here. Uh, in Japan, they have this bullet train, and the whole nose of it is, is created as actually a design based on genetic algorithms, which is one of the evolutionary way of, way of doing it. Uh, so you can see lots of parameters over there. So I was uh, fortunate to be there at the conference where they unveiled this. Um, so the people are asking them, why did you use GA? Why didn't you use a, a standard point-based method? They said, well, we used that first. But they, that method gave them a design. They went to wind tunnel to test, and it figured out that it didn't pass the test. So they, they got the idea that probably it got stuck into one of those local minima that they, were in, that, that they want to avoid from. So then somebody told them about GA, and they used and they found a design that passed the wind tunnel test. And now they are still in operation, if you go and see that. Uh, funny uh, thing that some person there commented that uh, because you used a genetic algorithm, this one looks like a snake. Does it look like a snake to you? Uh, I mean, if in, some, in some angle, if you take the picture, it actually looks like a living uh, object. Uh, maybe there is a connection, okay, the way you have the, uh, the, the, your solution represented and the way we use these operators, the objective functions may have matched with what the nature have been doing, but it could be a coincidence as well. But here is the, um, another one by Kone, uh, elevators. So a uh, long time ago, they did this in 95. Uh, if you go to a high raise building with Kone uh, elevators, if you press it at different floors, every half a second, they actually collect all the information and a GA is run instantly, and landing allocations are made. Which car should stop at what floor? Every half a second. So they have actually taken the GA algorithm, put it in a hardware. Okay, so that's why they could do it so fast. From their uh, manual, I have taken out this flowchart, and you can see it says allocate landing calls using genetic algorithm. Since 95, they have been evolving it. Now they have a multi-objective version as well. And this is the Mitsubishi Reg regional jet in 2017, very late lately. The whole aircraft is designed using population-based evolutionary method. The whole aircraft, everything you see here, inside, outside, is done. Because this was a conscious decision taken by the local government with universities around to have that as a project to show the world how powerful these methods could be. So here, government is working with academicians to come up with something really great. So there's a lot of things to learn from some of these countries and, and what, what they are able to achieve with the, with the new science and technologies. Okay, so these kinds of methods with examples out there and the algorithms being getting matured, where are they good at? Okay, so they're good at with the flexibility of the algorithm. You can change them, okay? Uh, there is this population idea that we have. So in every iteration, if you ask me, I'll give you not one solution, but maybe 10 different solutions which are almost equally good, okay? Or if you want, some solutions to be good for this criteria, some solutions to be good for another criteria, I could do because I have a population to keep different things. So suddenly you see you have power to, to collect and store multiple good solutions so later on you can make a decision. And there is an idea of implicit parallelism we talk again and again. Because you are dealing with a number of points, moving to another number of points, if some points are good in that population, that can, that can pull the whole population towards a good region. So that's the parallelism that you have in these methods. They are direct methods. We have not talked about gradients anywhere in the GA idea. You can handle procedural objectives and constraints very nicely. So these kinds of methods are also used in concept development. Like for example, uh, you want to build a tall structure. Uh, there are some members here which are going to be heavier than the members here, all these beam and column dimensions, we know that, right? This is, a, this is a fact, this is an engineering fact. Every structural engineer knows that the bottom most floor will have the thickest dimensions. As you go up, you can reduce them or keep it the same, right? You don't see a building having very thick columns at the top floor, right? Because that's not getting enough load. Most of the load is coming to the bottom one. So if that is something you learned in four years of your undergraduation, 
when you go an industry and try to use an optimization, why do you want to forget it? That's what I'm talking about heuristics. That's what I'm talking about your knowledge. Now, we need a methodology to use this knowledge. Okay, the point-based methods, you cannot do that. Like I said, x1 should be twice x2, if that is a knowledge, you couldn't have used with that method. So, but in these cases, what I'm talking about is a concept. Instead of finding or saying every floor, the columns and beams are my design variables, what I can say is that, well, I'm going to work with the ground floor dimensions as my variables, and I have a concept that the next one, higher up, this first floor, is going to be, let's say, 90% of the, the ground floor dimensions. Then the following one is probably, let's say, 95% or 98%, whatever. I can, so that fraction, either it's 90% or 98% is my only variable that's going all the way up to the 100th floor. So I have 99 variables, just 99 variables right there, and then maybe about 50 different variables for my ground floor. So that way I have saved a lot of variables, my search space, my algorithms get better. These are called concepts, okay? And these kinds of algorithms are used for concept development. So we have done very early on, my first uh, PhD students worked on this robot navigation through fuzzy logic systems. Uh, we've come up with a, uh, with, a, with a robot that has these ways of avoiding obstacles with some kind of rules. If the, if the obstacle is near uh, uh, and then it is ahead of me, like here, then this says, okay, move ahead left. So what is to be done here based on these two situations was the optimization problem. So we didn't, we didn't know where the obstacles are. We are giving the robot some rules that what it should do. So this is the concept that we are developing. Okay, the customization comes in many different ways. Let's say in that problem, here is a problem of cantilever beam. Most of you have done, if you have done mechanics, you must have solved problems like this. It's a cantilever beam means one side is welded, the other side you have a load. Uh, usually the dimensions for optimality would be that the dimension to reduce because most of the stresses will come here. This is a fact. Everybody who has done an applied mechanics course or solid mechanics course knows that. So we know that if I divide this thing into, into different uh, cylinders, their di dimensions here is going to reduce as we go. So that means x1, if this is x1, should be greater than or equal to x2, greater than or equal to x3. This will be a constraint, right? But what I could do is I could change these variables to a new set of variables where I say x1 is my variable, p2 is my new variable instead of x2. What is p2? p2 is x2 divided by x1, okay? I have defined it. p3 is x3 divided by x2, and I make a constraint on p2 saying p2 can only go from 0 to 1. That means what? x2 has to be smaller than equals to x3. So just by using these as variables and constraints on p's being 0 to 1, being a fraction, I have satisfied all this. There is a heaven and hell difference of how such a coding will work with optimization algorithms than the original one, where you are expecting, there are, if there are 100 variables there, you are expecting every consecutive variables to have this relationship at random is out of question. But if you if you change your variables to these kind of variables, you're making sure every solution you create has this property. So it requires a bit of intelligence and understanding of the problem, then you can come up with such a thing, okay? A software will not have that. That's where you need to come. And, and you don't need a PhD to do this, but uh, I'm just giving you a very simple example here, right? Similarly, other kinds of things we have done with this kind of customization. You have a VLSI problem, right? So you have, let's say, 36 different pieces to put on a square, okay? So you have numbers there, one, two, three, four, five. Now, how do you represent this? One solution could be the first one here, second one here, third one here. The other solution could be 10th one here, 8th one here, 31st one here, and so on and so forth. So that's also another solution. Every one of them will have a different size and all that. But how do you represent it? One way to do this is the regular combinatorics, combinatorics that you keep, the ordering, right? Ordering of these integers. But you could do a random key method where you create, if there are four elements there, you create four random numbers between zero and one. Let's say this is how they come up. You now sort them from smallest to highest. So this one is the smallest and this is the third one. So smallest one comes here means the third one, third object should be here. Then this one, so first object would be after that, then the fourth and the fifth like that. So you see, now you can, you, you can apply your optimization algorithm in this space, which is just a real space. Any number can come between zero and one, but you are deriving from it what the sequence should be. 
and, the, and you can now use a standard real parameter optimization. You don't have to go to combinatorial optimization. So there are other schemes that we have and these are much, much faster than working on the, on the combinatoric space. In working with industries, usually they will tell you one or two good solutions. So for example, in this case, two good solutions I have in my search space. I create an initial population by recombining these two, by mutating these two and create my initial population because I'm always starting from what actually worked, so my algorithm will not take much time. And I don't think there's any shame in using them, because sometimes academicians think, oh, you've diluted your work, but if you're solving for an industry problem, all they want is a good solution, and they will pat your back, probably give you another project, if you have helped them getting a better project. So there is a difference between academic research and applied research. So we do these things in applied research, but when we go and do academic research, we start with a random population and show what happens. But let me tell you, most of the time, the, the algorithms that are in journals do not work very well when you apply them to, apply, uh, to, uh, to industry problem. That's where we go in, but some of the methods that these mentioned about NSGA2 and NSGA3, those are very generic. Uh, in some problems, we could use them in practice, but we always have to customize to use them for practical problems. There are many, many other ways of doing these kinds of operations. So let me now show you one example where how we have used customization to solve a huge problem. So this came from an industry. Uh, every time you heat about 650 kilos of material for that particular industry, once you melt it, 650 kilo, you have to make a lot of castings. So this is a foundry that the problem came to me from. Um, you pour this to make five, six castings and you have, let's say you have consumed 640 kilos. 10 kilos are still left there. But none of these that are remaining is less than 10 kilos. So you cannot make any other. That 10 kilo is a waste, right? Then you have to melt again another 650 kilo and do that. At that point, if you think, oh, maybe I could have done some other combinations, maybe I could have utilized 645 kilos, uh, which would have saved you like five kilos of, of metal, right? So if you have to do it once, it's a piece of cake. But if you have to do it again and again and again over days, uh, you cannot do it by hand. You need an algorithm to do it. And that's what these people are doing. They wrote an Excel-based software to solve this problem. The fellow will fire it after his dinner, and next day morning, he will look at his laptop and see the solution. He would see that about 70 to 75% metal utilization was achieved by the Excel-based code that he had. And he could manually change a few things to improve. So it was not an efficient method. He came to me and said, can you help me with this? So first thing we do is we formulate the problem, okay, in a mathematical format, because we need to then apply our algorithm. So xij here is my variable, where xij is a matrix, as you see here, it says from the ith hit, the jth casting, how many copies you are going to make, because each of these casting, you may have to make 10 copies, 15 copies, and so on and so forth. And then you have an objective function that you have to maximize. Then you have constraints, which says for every hit, the amount of material you're supposed to utilize should be less than or equal to the amount of metal you've melted because it's a, it's a math problem. People doesn't, the, the, the algorithm doesn't know that this is the amount you want to utilize and this is the amount you have. If you make this 680, you haven't melted 600. So somehow you have to say that this has to be smaller than or equal to 650. So that's what these are. And there are many of them. For every row, there is one. And then this side, when I add, this is, order number one, and seven orders were given. This particular casting, you have to make seven copies. You don't want to make one extra. You don't want to make one less. You want to make exactly seven. So the summation of this should be seven, and that's what this says. For every column now, there is one constraint. But look at this formulation, x to the power one, x to the power one, x to the power one. So in all your objective functions are linear. It's called a linear programming. You could solve millions of linear programming uh, variables in a linear programming if this xij's can be non-integer, can be any real number. But as soon as you have a restriction that xij has to be an integer, why this has to be an integer here? So here is the thing. The first hit, this solution says, make one copy of the second casting, one of the third, two of the seven, one of the eight, and you're going to utilize 623. Now come and say, this has to be 1.25. What does it mean? That means you make one full copy and the other one 25%, come back three hours later and pour the remaining 75%. It's not going to work, right? So in this case, every one of them has to be an integer, including zero. And that makes all the difference 
in the whole literature on linear programming. Okay? They have a way to handle these integer restrictions through branch and bound, branch and card, branch and preserves different methods, but each of them is an exponential method. So if you have few variables, they work. If you have large variables, they don't. So in this problem, the industry required me to use about 50,000 variables. The problem was so big that 50,000. So I did some experiments with some commercial softwares for linear programming, including this integer linear programming part. We took a problem where we knew that 310 variable is the minimum that you need to solve it, and that's the optimum. Uh, one of the algorithms could not solve it. It's a public domain software. But Ciplex is a commercial software from IBM, and it's very uh, popularly used. Um, it could solve it, OK? Then you go to 1,000 variable. It could solve it. You see with 0.13 seconds, and you get 99.46% utilization. But when we give it a 2,000 variable problem, it could not solve it. So we are trying to investigate what happened. So these 2,000 variable problem, the number of nodes that it, that it branches to keeps on increasing. So after 30 minutes of my work with the, with the Ciplex method, it has opened up about 35 million nodes. Those I showed you only four or five nodes, right? It just branches into 35 million nodes. Of them, about 35,000 are still to be solved. So we ran it for another like 15 hours. Still, it did not solve. So up to about 1,800 variable was OK for this problem. It could solve, but when you go from 1800 to 2000, it was too much. The dimension is too much. So there is another name for these algorithms called cars of dimensionality. It kind of shows up here that there is a limit up to which you could do. After that, it's too much dimensions for the algorithm to handle. So we went in and designed an algorithm uh, based on our genetic operations, that's recombination and mutation. It's a population-based method. So what we do in that recombination is we take two parents. I'm showing you a very simple example with just four hits. We compare them hit by hit. So for these two solutions, if this one is better than that, I'm going to take a copy. In this case, this requires 625. This requires 343. I take the 625. Then the next one, it's 808. It requires 667. Both are not allowed. But this is a little closer to 650. So I take a copy of this and put here. Like that, this one now 629 versus 606. This is better. I take a copy here and put there. So this is how you're mixing some from parent one and some from parent two because you can partially evaluate uh, a part of the solution. That's a recombination. You're going to screw up the constraints and then we have two mutation operator to fix those and they are able to then solve this problem. I'll show you those problems it solves very easily. 2000 variable it solves easily to 99.596% and that's really the optimum for this problem. Then we go and do experiments with a million variable version of the problem because this project was done and, and we had a restriction for three years we could not use. After that, we, we tried to publish this. We actually pub published this after that. This is an experiment we did on a million variable problem. And you can see that with the, as you increase the population size, the algorithm starts to work. And there exists a critical population size beyond which it always works. Uh, so based on this, we always recommend what is the size that you need to use. But I want to show you the big picture here, where we go from 50,000 variables, which the company was uh, interested in, which we can give them in less than 10 seconds. And each of these solutions here, are we are stopping with the criteria that when you get 99.7% utilization, we stop. So we didn't go all the way to the optima, because these problems are called knapsack uh, type problems. These are NP hard, which means you cannot have a polynomial time algorithm for solving it with large number of variables. So, but here, I'm showing you this on a log log plot, right? This is a logarithm. This is in logarithm. So if you see a straight line in a log log plot means it's a polynomial time performance, right? And then the question is, how can you have a polynomial time algorithm? But the answer to that is, we are not finding the optimum. We are finding very, very close to the optimum. So the optimum cannot be more than 100%, right? You cannot utilize more material than what you melted. So maximum will be 100%, and we put ourselves to that target, 99.7%. So every one of them is feasible, and it's doable. It's slightly approximate from the optima, but we get very fast. It's, a, it's more than linear, less than quadratic. With the slope, you see that. And the interesting thing is we go up to billion variable problem. So I think this and his students here have solved 
a couple of billion variable problem uh, in his lab over here. So if you think properly, these things are possible. So I think beyond these two work, I don't know of any other, any other place people have worked with such a large dimensional uh, uh, problem with uh, such a long range of uh, uh, problems. The problem is still hard, as I'm showing you here. If you try to get to closer and closer to the optima, you have to spend super exponential time to get there. But if you say, I'm interested in cutting it off, at some point, I'm happy with that performance, polynomial time methods are possible. OK, now I'm going to quickly talk to you about multiple criteria, because this, so far, I've talked about single criteria. In multiple criteria, you have more than one objective. So this is a thing that everybody uh, will eventually have to decide. If you want to buy a car and you look at your pocket, everybody will buy one type of car. But then the other side of it, the comfort, the safety is not met. So if you want better comfort or most comfortable car or most safe car, you probably have to buy such a car which is 10 times more expensive than that. So that's what happens when you have a conflicting type of objectives. You get into what is known as a Pareto optimal set, Pareto optimal solutions. There are a number of solutions that are optimal. Pareto was an Italian scientist with, in his name, this is, thing is given. So these solutions are optimal. None of these here in the blue region is optimal. So that's the whole idea. Here is one problem where your target is to get number of solutions. And remember I told you we have a population so we can capture number of solutions there. This is an interesting slide I got from uh, Bob Fulton. Um, the multidisciplinary optimization which, which kind of embraces multi-objective optimization because every criteria, every discipline can give you at least one or two objectives. Uh, if you're interested in just a aeroplane design with production engineering is the only goal, you are going to have such an aircraft. If weight is the only thing that you're thinking, this is what. If uh, aerodynamics is the only consideration, you'll have that. So, um, so, but you don't see any of the aircrafts look like any of these, right? Because all of these things are of interest to you. So when you have such a thing, you need to have multiple criteria coming into it. You can't avoid, and this is not in only aerospace, any field that you look at. So all the literature you have on single objective drives you. It's not the end of it. It just tells you some methodologies, but eventually you need to understand how to use multiple conflicting criteria. Okay, so I wrote a book back in 2001 about all these uh, ideas and concepts of multi-objective optimization and how evolutionary methods can, can do. What we do is we take the problem, we find this uh, representative set, and then we go to decision makers to choose one. Okay, so NSGA2, what uh, this has just mentioned, uh, works in this way, as you can see, this is an SGA2, where there are two objectives here, starting from random solutions, you can see how this comes towards the Pareto front. Now, when you are minimizing both objectives, this becomes your Pareto set, there is nothing below it, it cannot go, so it gives you a good representative idea of 100 different solutions here. Uh, this is our latest NSGA3. Uh, it's, it works for very well for more than three objectives, and three objectives, you can see how nice a distribution you can get. This is a Pareto surface now, when you have three objectives, one, two, and three, starting from random solutions, it gets to the Pareto surface because there's nothing below it, and it can give you a nice representative idea of your optimal solutions. There are about 100 optimal solutions here. Now you can go to the decision maker with few of them, and the decision maker will guide you that I like this objective more than that objective, but you have 100 of them to look at, analyze eventually. So doing these kinds of multi-objective optimization, finding number of interesting solutions can help you make decision eventually and choose one in a much better way. So this field has started on very recently, you see early 90s, uh, but very rapidly grown. And uh, if it has grown, usually a field happens like this, it grows and then kind of stabilizes. But these many objective methods like NSGA3 started around 2010, 13, and now we are going another exponential phase there. So even with this, I, I think I've, I did this in last year, about a year ago, uh, about 7,000 papers per year, which is really uh, uh, phenomenal, considering only that started around early 90s. Where are these things being applied? Uh, you can see mostly engineering and computer science, okay? Uh, but then, about 50% of them, but then there are mathematics, business, decision sciences, physics and astronomy. I was surprised to see medicine also material science, biochemistry. So it's, this is one area, this multi-criteria optimization has gone out of computer science and engineering and went to all these other fields. 
So, because all these people need to consider multiple criteria for coming up with the experiment, for coming up with the design, and they're looking for stuff and they come to our field and find it. There are, there are codes, there are softwares available. So I think we have contributed in some sense to the entire science and technology area. Um, because of the time, what I'm going to do now, uh, I'm going to be very restrictive, just going to talk about innovation because this has already mentioned a few things about it. This is one of our major uh, interest in research, also in this lab and my lab. So what this means is that we want to discover some rules at the end of the design process, at the end of the optimization process. If you take any design, and this is a very good thing for you to do a class project or maybe a thesis, uh, that a lot of new things can come out which you didn't even realize. Consider two conflicting criteria for solving the problem. Here I'm showing you electric motor design where my goal is to maximize the power rating and then minimize the size of the motor. So they are in conflict. If you want to get high power, you got to have a bigger motor. We know that. So that's the conflict. But if you do that and run an NSGA2 on your model, you get a number of Pareto solutions. Okay, so there will be small size motors, which is good for the size, big size motors which is good for the rated, and there are a lot of other compromise solutions. Now, you eventually you can choose one for application, whatever, that's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is, if you look at from here to there, in a systematic manner if you go, there are variables. What are variables in electric motor design? There is armature inside. What is the diameter? That's one of the variables. There is a wearing that is done on top of this. How many turns do you have? What is the diameter of the wear? What is the insulation thickness? So all these will determine how much power you can get eventually, and then what is the size, right? So there are variables inside. If you look this one to this one to this one, do you expect with your engineering background now that they will all randomly change, or there will be some pattern? There will be some kind of regularity. You expect some regularity, right? When you go from here to there. If you can understand that regularity, just imagine what you have understood. You've actually understood how to design a motor optimally. And that knowledge stays with you for future design. So that's what we're talking about. So what is the procedure then? First you find, first you think of two or three criteria problem, criteria for your problem, and then use one of these methods to find the Pareto set, and then do a data mining analysis, data analytics on them to figure out what is common, what is preserved, what kind of features are constant or kind of invariant in them. So we've been doing lots of algorithms, machine learning methods for that. I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Maybe this is a, uh, a gearbox design. There are 28 variables we found with all these Pareto points. 27 of them are exactly the same. The way, not exactly the same, you see, they're almost the same over small power to high power, but more or less the same. The way these things are changing, the gearboxes are changing is through the module. Module seems to be changing in a drastic manner with the power. And if I fit a curve through this, it turns out that module has a proportionate rule here with square root of power. So I've learned a rule, I've learned a knowledge here that in order to optimally design the motors, module has to be set in proportion to square root of power. This is something new I've learned. If I do it this way, I'm designing things optimally. If you increase module that, that way, then you are increasing your size of the, of the di diameters of these gears because diameters is proportional to module and that's the optimal way of doing it. So people may be designing it for ages but never paying attention what is actually going on? What are the properties of these solutions? So this is one of the ways you can not only get the solution but also learn. One of my students applied this to 2020 cricket, <laughs> informing the team. Uh, so, uh, you know, Shah Rukh Khan, for example, every, every year he's forming a team, right? So, if you have all the players, this was, this was done in 2010, where Chennai Super King was the, was the winner. So, we are forming an 11-player team with all the IPL rules, okay? Uh, like four foreign players maximum and one wicket keeper and all these things. So, we came up with an idea of batting average and a bowling average from the data that is, uh, that is uh, there in the Wisden database, and we are forming each point here has 11 players in them, and we somehow accumulate their batting score if they play against somebody, and then the bowling average score. So then we put them over there. These are all the Pareto solutions, and I could give you about 30, 40 different teams which would have beaten Chennai Super, King, Super Kings if we played it on my computer, okay, not in the field, okay? 
uh, because that's all we could do. We cannot ask these players to go and play again and again. But now the interesting thing is when we look at all these solutions, because each one of them is 11 players, we collected all the players and doing a frequency analysis of how often each of these players are, are appearing here. Now some of the names you can recognize, you have to go back to 10 years almost. Uh, there and some of them are, most of them are not playing now. But these are some very good players at that time which reflected from their data. And this kind of analysis shows that these are the very good players because Saha appears to be in almost 90 teams over here. And this fellow appears to be about 80 teams over there. So if I am the team owner, I should do such a study and pick my players who has these picks over here, right? So a uh, lot of applications you could do if you are, obviously models need to be made and all that. So I'm going to now go to the end because you got some idea about what I'm talking about with multi-objective. Uh, I'm going to just spend uh, two slides on current trends because you should know. So this is, all these are going on like 2010, 13, 14, but these are very recent. Surrogate assisted optimization, uncertainty handling for finding robust, reliable designs. Bi-level I already mentioned. Uh, mixed integer, large scale, dynamic optimization. Your problem is changing with time but you have to track, you have to still find the optima. A many objective, which more than three objectives, learning based optimization, more like this innovation and innovative applications. There is never a dearth of that. So we've actually done some taxonomy of different ways of doing surrogate modeling. Uh, we've applied this to some problems in automotive industries close to us. This is one from, from Ford. And we actually designed that gasket which comes between the engine head and the engine uh, that controls the water flow. Uh, using the surrogate modeling approach because the time taken to simulate was two days to evaluate one solution. Uh, then we did this uh, robustness study on a, on a power dispatch problem and we found some part of the Pareto front is robust, some part is not. So when you do the robust study, the robust part comes out in that uh, sensitive area. So it's very interesting. Then dynamic optimization, bi-level optimization, we applied this to some agriculture. So this is in Iowa, uh, Raccoon Watershed, uh, where the government and the farmer, I told you, we actually applied here and, and got some results for that. Uh, our recent studies are moving into, uh, going out from engineering and moving into more like computer applications to computer graphics and all that. So we do a deep neural net for architecture search. We are using an SGA. Uh, just three, uh, last week, uh, our, uh, our annual conference was in Prague and our paper won the best paper award on this um, DNN architecture search that we did. Uh, we came up with, so these are like huge uh, th 32 by 32 images and about 10,000 images here to classify. Lots of cats, dogs, airplanes and all that you need to, you need to classify. So, and in this field, mostly Google and uh, IBM uh, with these big giants have lots of GPUs. Only they could get to about, you can see here, this is the error, 4.47% error, 3.65, they're very good. So only 3-4% error you are making in the classification. But look at the parameters they have in their search, look at the time, the GPU days they took in order to get to that accuracy. This is our NSGNet. 3.85% uh, error comparable with only 3.3 million parameters, okay? And it takes only eight GPUs. Uh, with recent techniques that we are using, we have the best result now, 2.75, um, 2.5% uh, 2 error. And these are only with like four GPU days. So four GPU days we are spending on these huge problems. Uh, it's because we have this background, we have this NSGA with the bi-objective approach to get to this kind of structure. Okay, I'm going to leave this example because of time, but this is something we did for uh, New Zealand for a land use management problem. This is a real application involving local Maoris, which are the tribes there and the local government as two different stakeholders. So eventually all these are telling is um, large scale problems with this, this one at 14 different objectives that we consider. Eventually the story is coming down to, I'm just going to get to this one here, yeah, this one. So where you have an astronomically large search space and some of these social problems, huge search space. From that, you need a very good algorithm to come down to about 150 to 100 different solutions, which is where our evolutionary multi-objective methods come in. Once you get them, you cannot show all 100 of them to these decision makers. In that case, it was Maoris, which is a local tribe and the government. So we start from what they don't like and then go towards what they like 
and we find out where is the cutoff that they say, okay, from here on I can take it. We go to the other person. Fortunately, in this case, these four solutions were common. Okay? Then we said, can you choose one? But they were not able to choose. So then we use what is known as the AHP, analytical hierarchy process. These are different decision-making tool uh, which we use you involving them. So they were, they were then giving pairwise comparisons and making pairwise comparisons and giving us inputs. Finally, we get the winner, which is the third one. So the idea in these things is starting with very large scale problem down to few that are interesting and close to optimal, then have a decision making. Because if you are the computer guy doing all this, you cannot decide for them. Here is the final solution. Nobody will like that. So you go to them with few solutions and then let them compare them and choose them and give you further information so you can help them choose one eventually. So um, what I try to show and cover in this lecture is to impress you with that there are many, many problems in practice where optimization can be a way to solve it, right? That's one thing. Classical methods with point base that I said have their, have their niche, have their own kind of problems. We need to understand that because sometimes we want to use them as well. But evolutionary population based methods as I showed is I found to be very, very flexible. But there is a bit of onus you have that you need to make it right. You need to do some experiments. You need to take the problem information and put it there. But if you're trying to solve these difficult problems, there is I think no other way. Because solving mathematical programming problem as they come are very difficult with point based methods. When you have practicalities to be considered. Uh, and you have to use all your parallel search ability, your parallel processors if you have customization is the key. Uh, optimization for knowledge discovery is something that is, I, I found starting around 2006 when I was in Kanpur. Uh, but now it's getting big. I, I, I talk to different industries of all the things that I'm doing in my lab. This is one thing they pick up. They say, no, this is something we want to try in our problem. Uh, so I have few students now working on this knowledge discovery part and I'm happy that in Spark project we're doing very similar stuff. So I think at the end I want to say that optimization stays at the core of most problem solving tasks. You cannot ignore them. Uh, you should embrace them and see every ways if the students can get at least some exposure to the optimization before they go out. I think if any university in the world, if they can make optimization as a basic course, uh, even at the senior level at the undergrad or at the first year level at the masters, and they announce it, industries will come and industries will pick them because they know that they have problem solving ability. They can solve problems, right? So with that, I'll stop and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>